Salma Teacher 7, Mr. Barry here. This is Computer Literacy Class Number 1. And we're going to be going over the very basics with the Computer Literacy course. Now, I started teaching the course back in 2000, and I wrote my first curriculum that went with the course back at that time. And I'd go step by step with the students with everything back then. And so I wrote that. And then I updated it. By 2010, we have this. So it's much, much thicker here, as you can see. But uh, this is the 2010 edition. If, you, if I just open up anywhere, we can see that it, it takes the students step by step on how to do everything. Basically, what we're seeing today is the upgraded or updated version of this book here. And I can do that because I'm the author. Now, we're going to be watching a video that I made back in 2018, but we're going to be doing it through Google Meet. And that's for all the students who've actually taken the time to register for my free class. Now, um, what I usually do in the video is I let it play in the background. You'll see me in there in the corner of the video screen. And then I pause it and I update it, uh, update the literature from there and that will be doing the live stream. What you're seeing right now is just the straight video and what I'm going to be doing in the video stream is pausing it but you won't see that in this version. Basically this is for students who just want to see the lesson and want to uh, experience that. We have questions at the end and those questions are there but you're not going to be seeing the actual live stream. That's reserved for students who actually register for the free computer course. Now, which schools are paying me to do that live streaming uh, to help individuals one-on-one -on -one as they need it? Well, that's Selma Unified School District as well as Kings Canyon Unified School District. They're the ones paying me to do those classes. And these classes will be meeting every Tuesday from 4 to 6.30. Pacific Standard Time and what I do is if you're interested in the class you simply register I'll have the link to how to register in the description you just do that you put in your email address other information there and then I'll contact you send you a link to the actual live streaming so that you can participate that way now going back to the course and the structure of the course um, the very first two, basically two and a half lessons, are the very, very basics. We go over um, the, the placement of where you can find your keys on a Chromebook because the, the key structure or the keyboard is a little bit different than you would find in a Macintosh or a Windows machine. So I, I point out those differences so that you don't feel lost if you are using a Macintosh computer or if you're using a Windows machine or even if you're using a Chromebook. The lessons that we have um, will be going step by step into using certain things such as your Google Drive. Now your Google Drive is that one place that stores all of your files, all of your work um, and it's an online storage so you log in securely using your Gmail account and we'll talk more about that in the lesson as I get into all those details remember this one is very basic and I'm actually going to let the video play here in a few moments and go over everything there for you alrighty we'll see you hopefully on Tuesdays and that will be through, through the Google Meet Thank you again, and we'll continue with the lesson. Selma Teacher 7, Mr. Barry here. This is lesson number one, or day number one, for the computer literacy course. Now, a lot of the skills that we cover on the very first days are very basic, but I also try to cover other things there in class, because one of the nice things about me being in person is you have the second me. So I actually get to be there in person and helping everyone as you need it. Now, what's really nice about me being there in person is I get to walk around and help individuals right there step by step. If anyone has a question, you can raise your hand. I'll be happy to answer the question. Plus, many times, other people have the exact same question, so I get to answer that there in class and everyone gets to benefit at the same time. 
So it's true that many times I will be pausing this video and then going in to further detail right there with you. There you go. Let's get started with lesson number one. Go ahead and open up to chapter one in our book and right away you'll see that we have contact information. I'll be giving you other emails that you can reach me with as well as different phone numbers that you can reach me in case you ever have a question there at home while you're doing the projects. By the way, before we get any further into lesson number one, let me just let you know that I'm using Google Docs and other free Google applications that you can find in the Google Drive. So a lot of the class uh, core that we're sticking with is found within the Google ecosystem. Now you can use these on a Windows machine or a Macintosh machine and I will be going over how these relate to Microsoft Word and Excel and so I'll be going over both platforms for you and show you a little bit of the difference. Just to let you know that the word art that you see at the very beginning that looks like this, that's Google's word art and let me show you how I do that real quick. So here I am within my Google Drive. Now what's one thing that's really nice about the Google Drive is it works offline. So if I'm on my Chromebook or if I'm on another laptop and I'm offline, that means I'm not in an internet connection, I can still get to my Google Drive, find my Google Documents that are saved there and edit them and then once I'm back online, Google Drive will automatically synchronize those documents for me. So let me show you real fast how I do the word art. I'll click on new, go down to Google Docs, and then I'll create it in this folder here. And then I'll go to click on insert, drawing. From drawing, I go into actions and then word art. And let's just put an example here. So after you've typed in your message, click on enter or hit the enter key and you'll see it there. Now the standard one is rather bland. So what I like to do is click on the font selection and I like to choose a different font. So let's choose lobster for this one. Now just in case you go there and you don't see the font that you like, you can always click on more fonts and there's literally thousands and thousands of different fonts for you to choose from. So I'm going to choose lobster changes it there. See if I want to change the color to let's say red here and once I'm really happy with it, I'm not quite happy with it, let's change the angle of it, make it a little bit larger. There you go. Now let's say that I'm happy with that one. I'll click on save and close and it puts it within my document. Now let's say that I wasn't quite as happy as I thought I was. I can simply double click on that. It brings it back up. I can double click on the text and I can change the text. So I'll put a one in there and that adds the one to my word art. And I said, well, actually I wanted a border. So I can click on a the border, make it wider if I wanted to. I can change the border color. So if I wanted it to be, um, kind of a brownish color there. There we go. And I can even change other apps, aspects about this. Once again, I'm happy with everything. I can click on save and close and there I go. Then what I do is I take that and I use it in a green screen uh, setting for my video editing app. And that's how I insert the text. And Google Docs allows me to open and edit Microsoft Word documents. I can then save them again as Microsoft Word or I could save it as a PDF or any other way that I want to. So it's a very versatile and handy tool. Now going back to the lesson, here we are. Welcome to the Computer Literacy Course. I'm very happy to see you here in the 16 part course which will develop and fine tune your computer skills. In this course we will do more than just learn the basics. We will be learning new skills and making our computers more useful in a wide variety of everyday applications from using them as a means to make free phone calls to cooking timers and even giving us answers to everyday problems. We will be working with Chromebooks, Windows 10 PCs, smartphones, printers and other hardware to gain practical working knowledge of these devices. 
Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Daniel Berry. I received a BA degree in teaching back in 1999. In 2000, I received my teaching credentials in both K-12 through and adult education. I have taught computer skills and mouse that is Microsoft Office User Specialist at Sierra Valley College. I am currently working at with both Selma and Kings Canyon Adult Schools. I also build PCs for the Reedley area. Hope that everyone learns and grows during the unfolding of this course. The skills that will be covered during the course are 1. PC terminology and identification, Windows and Chrome terminology, Windows and Chrome navigation, Program terminology, Program navigation, Email proficiency, Internet navigation, Search proficiency, and then also with Word processing and spreadsheet competence. Other skills and proficiencies will be covered throughout the length of course. For example, speeding up windows and digital camera lessons are also included. These saucers are here to point out special notes, so whenever you see one, pay attention to what he is pointing out for you. Let's now go to page 2. For today, we'll be looking over the basics of working with a computer. We'll be looking at logging into your computer, the PC mouse, keyboards, opening applications, the desktop, using Windows buttons found in the upper right hand corner, using Google Chrome to browse the internet, closing your programs, shutting down the PC. So let's get started with logging in. Computer users need to log in to ensure that they only see and use their own data and apps. This increases the security of their electronic information such as their photos, documents and other work. If you have a Windows 7, 8, or 10 machine, you turn on the computer by pressing the power button. Then you log in to that computer using your username and password. And then you'll see your desktop. If you have a Chromebook, you'll be using the Chrome OS. So you turn on your computer by opening the laptop or pressing the power button. You will then be greeted with a login screen. Key in your login credentials. In this case, your Gmail or your Google username and password. After you've done that, you'll see your desktop. Let's now go to page three, the mouse. The mouse, as you see there, has the left button, the scroll wheel in the middle, and the right button. The right click will always bring down a special menu. The mouse is the tool which we use to navigate through the Windows graphical interface. The PC mouse normally has two buttons, the left one and the right one. The left button is used to open programs and documents. The right button is special because it is used to bring down context menus at, from icons and other items. The scroll wheel can be used to scroll down pages. During the lessons, a click is always done by pressing the left button. The right button is depressed only when the right click is called for. On newer laptops, a right click is done by pressing both fingers down on your touchpad simultaneously. Next is the touchpad. Touchpad uses the tip of your finger to move the mouse pointer around the screen. The buttons below the touchpad represent the same left and right buttons on the desktop mouse. If no right button is present, a right click can be done by pressing the control key and then clicking on the object that you wish to click on or by using the two fingers in a piece formation on the touchpad. The mouse pointer. While you control the computer through the use of the mouse, the computer is communicating to you through the mouse pointer. When the computer has received a command from you to start an application, the mouse pointer will change to the busy pointer to let you know that the computer is busy processing the last command that you should not click again during this time. Let's go on now to common mouse pointers and what they mean. The first one is the normal select. It's just a plain white arrowhead. The next one that we see is a mouse pointer that's black and that's for the Chrome OS. Working in background is next and that's where you have the pointer with the circle and the next one is the mouse pointer with a circle. Busy is just a circle by itself and that means the computer is busy working in the background and again you should not click on anything during that time because it won't respond. Next is position select. We use this when we're selecting areas on an image. Next is text select. Then we have vertical resize which allows you to resize an image or word art in the vertical plane. 
Next is the horizontal resize, which allows you to resize an image or word art in the horizontal plane. Then you have diagonal resize, which will resize the entire image or word art. Next is move object, which is four little arrows that allow you to move the object to a new location. And then we have zoom in and zoom out. Being aware of the mouse pointer's appearance as you work with the computer will greatly help you in working more efficiently. Let's go on now to page five. Special note, if the mouse pointer is too small, you can resize it and make it larger. If you have a Windows machine, click on the start button and then key in the word pointer. Select change the mouse pointer display from the options that are shown. And then select pointers and choose the pointer scheme that you wish to use. In this case, large. If you have a Chrome OS, such as Chromebook, click on the customized control menu that's the three small dots found in the upper right hand corner. And then select settings from that menu. Key in large mouse into the search box. And then select show large mouse cursor in the options that are shown. Let's go on now to keyboard. Next to the mouse, the keyboard is the most used input device on desktop computers. An input device is any hardware that allows the user, that's you, to enter data into the computer. So now you know what an input device is. Next is using the keyboard. Whether you are writing a letter, a report, or calculating numerical data, your keyboard is great for entering information efficiently. Your keyboard can also be used to control your computer. For example, with just a few simple keyboard commands, you could do the same task as many mouse clicks. The keys are organized by their function. Let's look at the basics of keyboard operation and go on to keyboard commands. So here you can see in this diagram, the keys are organized by their function, the alphanumeric keys being in the middle. And then we have the navigation keys and then the numeric keypad over on the right hand side. At the top, we have the function keys and along the corners are the control keys. Please note that a USB keyboard or a mouse can be plugged into any laptop or a Chromebook if the laptop's keyboard is too small. Let's go on now to page six, special control keys. So these are the keys that are usually around the edges such as the escape, the F keys, and also down towards the bottom, you have the control keys. First one we'll look at is the Alt key. This shows menu options when used by itself. When used with other keys, it can select those options. Control. By itself, it does nothing. However, when pressed with other keys, it can open and sets other options for us. The Control Alt Delete. This opens the task manager that allows us to manage our jobs such as our applications or other things that are working in the background allows you to close off an app that's not responding, for example. Next is delete. This delete files, folders, and selected text. When used with other specific keys, it can take on other features. Escape closes dialog boxes and open menus. The F1 always opens the help menu. Windows logo opens the start menu. These special keys act like shortcuts and can save you time when used in the right combination. Next is the Alt-Tab trick. You may switch between open apps within Windows by using the keyboard shortcut Alt-Tab. The Alt-Tab shortcut is done by pressing and holding the Alt key, which is found near the lower portion of the keyboard, near the spacebar. As you are pressing the Alt key, press the Tab key once the tab key is found on the left hand side of the keyboard. If you have two or more programs that are running, a new window will open in front of your work as you see here. So notice here you have five different applications and you can switch which one is on the, the front or taking up all the space. There's other ways that you can manage your apps too. The Alt Tab trick is great and a fast way to switch between open apps. Let's now go to page number seven. Getting to know the keyboard on your Chromebook. The design of the Chromebook is a little different from traditional notebooks. The first difference that you will notice are the function keys on the top of the screen which serve as shortcuts to common tasks. 
The first key on the Chromebook is the Escape key. The Escape key will interrupt or cancel the current process or the running program. Or it can also close the pop-up window. Next are the arrow keys. The arrow keys will allow you to go back or forth to previously visited web pages. Next is the refresh key. The refresh key will refresh the web page being viewed. Next is a small square with little arrows inside. This will enter and exit full screen mode. So if you have an application and you want to take up the full screen, just press that key there. Next is a little square with three little lines. This key shows all the windows in overview mode. In fact, it's very similar to using the Alt Tab trick in Windows. Next, we see a small sun and a large sun. These keys will dim or brighten the display. But if you use the Alt and those keys, then they will also dim or brighten your keyboard if it is backlit. Next, you have the mute, volume down, volume max keys. And then the last one there is your power button. Some Chromebooks do not have a caps lock key and instead of function keys you have dedicated keys for managing your Chrome browser. Getting used to this may take a little while but once you know your way around I am sure you'll enjoy it. The search key and the caps lock key. The caps lock key has been replaced with the search key which opens the apps menu. The apps menu is used in the same way as the start menu is used in a Windows PC. When you need the caps lock on, just use this following keyboard shortcut, Alt and Search. So the search key is that one key that has a small magnifying glass in it. Press those two keys and then your caps lock is on. When the caps lock is turned on, you will see an up arrow icon next to the time in the taskbar. Let's now go on to page 8. There's no more delete key. Yes, there is no delete key on most Chromebooks. Here is the keyboard shortcuts that you can use instead. Delete the next letter. That is for delete. Press and hold the Alt key and then tap the backspace key. Next, delete the previous word. Just use the backspace. How to instantly see all of the Chromebook keyboard shortcuts instantly? Well, it's easy. Just press Alt and Control and then the slash or the question mark on your keyboard as you see I'm pointing there and when you press those three keys the shortcuts will come up on your screen now to see which shortcuts go with the control just press and hold the control key on your keyboard and then those shortcuts come up to see them associated with the alt key press the alt key in fact you can press other keys on your keyboard during this mode and see any shortcuts that are related to them to escape this window, just press the escape key. If you don't like the Chromebook's keyboard, you can plug in a USB keyboard into your Chromebook. Now remember, this is if you prefer the traditional keyboard layout. Now let's go to page 9, Common Mouseless Shortcut Table. Now these shortcuts are nice to know, but you don't have to memorize them. Whenever I need you to do something like Control a to highlight everything that instruction will actually be in the list of things to do so you don't have to worry about memorizing all of these but let's just go over them here if you want to select all the items within a window it's control a to open the start menu it's control escape to open a new window control n to send the document or a photo to the printer it's control p to copy the selected text or image control c to paste the selected text or image, control V. To cut the selected text out, control X. To delete the selected item, control D. To undo the last action, that's control Z. Now you just don't know how important that is. A lot of new people come into class and they make mistakes. It's easy to make mistakes. Um, if you ever make a mistake, don't panic. All you have to do is use the shortcut Control Z and it'll undo your last steps. So if you made three mistakes in a row, just go Control Z, Control Z, Control Z, and it'll undo each of those steps. Oops, maybe you, you undid too many of your actions. If that's the case, then all you have to do is redo the last action with the shortcut Control Y. 
Next, you can use the arrow keys to switch between open items, that's Control alt tab You can change the size of the icons on your desktop by using Control and the mouse scroll wheel. So if, you, if your icons are too small on your desktop, you press and hold the Control key and then you scroll up or scroll down on your, with your mouse and boom, the icons will change size. Next, you can cycle through the active elements of a window. That's the tab key. If you need to ever open help, that's the F1 key. Rename the selected item, that's F2. Open the search window, that's F3. Display the address bar within the Windows Explorer, that's F4. Refresh the active window is F5. And then cycle through the screen elements within a window, that's F6. The next one that we have is a biggie. This is closes the active window. It doesn't sound very important, does it? But it is. Let's say you're working along and a pop-up window appears on your work or in front of your work. All you have to do is press the and hold the Alt key and then tap the F4 key on your keyboard and choom, that window goes away. Next, cycle through the items in order of which they were opened. That's Alt Escape. You can switch between open out items, that's Alt Tab. Display properties on the selected item, that's, that's Alt Enter. And then you can also open the shortcut menu for the active window, that's Alt Space. You can also select more than one item in a window or on the dis desktop, or select text within the document, that's Shift and F10. You can delete the selected item without moving it to the recycle bin, that's shift delete. You can prevent the CD from automatically playing, that's shift while you're inserting the CD into the CD player. And you can cancel the current task by pressing the escape key. These shortcuts work on Windows PCs and most of these shortcuts also work within a Chromebook. By using the shortcut commands, you can open the start menu and open any application without ever using your mouse. You can also find help by pressing the F1 key, no matter which app you're using. Let's now go to page 10, the desktop. Once the computer has started up or booted, we will see the desktop. The desktop holds all of our icons and may even display a background photo for us. Normally we press the power button once, that's usually found there on the desktop machine. Then we'll see the screen, which shows the which operating system we have, and that's called the splash screen. After the splash screen appears, we see the desktop. The desktop is the main screen area that you see after you turn on your computer and log into Windows. It has been around since Windows 95 and has grown to include many new and helpful features in later versions of Windows. It behaves like an actual desk and holds your work. When you open programs or folders, they appear on the desktop. You can also put things on the desktop such as files and folders and arrange them however way that you want. So here we see a Windows 7 desktop with a recycle bin, icons, the start menu, the taskbar that's running along the bottom, the notification area that holds the time. Next we have the Windows 10 desktop with icons, the app launcher or start menu, and then we have a special area here. You simply click in there and you type your question or anything that you want to look for and Cortana will look for you. Cortana is the Windows search assistant. But it does more than just searches. It can also help you arrange your data book and other things. Next we have the applications down there that are pinned to the taskbar and then the notification area is holding your time. Now we have the desktop on a Chromebook where you have the app launcher found in the lower left hand corner and then you have your applications that are pinned to your taskbar or shelf in this case. Then you have your notification area and then your control center holding your time and other important icons for you. Let's now go on to page 12 with app shortcuts. Icons represent apps that are normally not the apps themselves. This is good to remember when you wish to delete or uninstall an app, which we'll discuss in a later lesson. Let's now look at the Windows taskbar and the Chrome OS shelf. 
The taskbar or shelf is the long horizontal line that runs along the bottom of the screen. It holds the start button or the app launcher on the left and the assistant tray or the notification area on the right. In the middle it shows you which programs you're using at the time. When a program is minimized it moves to the taskbar. To open it again just click it and it will be restored to its normal size. Within the Chrome OS, Windows 7, 8, and 10, you may add shortcuts of your favorite programs right on the taskbar simply by right clicking the program icon and selecting Pin to Taskbar. The system tray or notification area holds the icons for Wi Fi connectivity, battery usage, date and time. It also acts as a shortcut to many of the computer settings. Now let's take a look at these important notification icons and what they mean. First off, within Windows. Here's the normal battery charging, normal battery draining. Then we have an update is available, no network or network error, connected to the Wi-Fi, and then notification icon. Next we are looking in a Chromebook. If you see the very first one there is normal battery charging. So that's a battery with a little Z inside of it. That's normal battery charging there. And then normal battery draining. An update is available. And updates basically refer to like their security or driver updates for your operating system so it better runs on your machine. And these updates within Chrome only take seconds to do so they're very very quick. Next is no network or network error. Connected to Wi-Fi is the next one and the last icon there is notification icon. Let's now go on to page 13. Within Windows 7 and 10 we have what's called the arrow peak. This shows the desktop. It's a special little icon that's next to the time. When you click it or float your mouse over it, it displays your desktop. Please note that you can change the time found within the notification area simply by right clicking it and then selecting adjust time. Let's now go over the start menu or app launcher. This first one here is what we see on a Windows 10 and this one is what we see on a Chromebook. The Start Menu or App Launcher is the main gateway to all the applications on your computer. It is called the Start Menu or App Launcher because it is the first place where most users begin their task of opening their applications. The Start Menu or App Launcher has a search box to find apps, documents, or even internet content. Just key in a word that is found within the document that you are looking for and it will bring it up. It will also show the local weather. So if you're looking for a document and the document has the word bananas in it, you actually click in there and just type in bananas and it looks through all of your documents. And if there's a document that has the word bananas in it, it actually brings it up. It's pretty amazing. And this works within the Chromebook as well as a Windows laptop. Let's now go on to page 14 using the Windows buttons found in the upper right hand corner. The first button looks like a minus symbol. It will minimize the applications to the bottom of the screen. The second is the restore or maximize button. It will cause the application to either take up less space, that is restore, or take up the entire screen, which we call maximize. The last button is the close button. This button will turn off the application. You can also use the shortcut Alt plus F4 on your keyboard to turn off any application. These Windows buttons can be found on most of the applications that you might use. So use them to your advantage. With these buttons it is possible to see more than one window at a time. Let's take a look. So I'm going to drop out of full screen mode here and now I'm going to go in and I can use these keys. These are the keys I was talking about earlier. You can also use shortcuts. Now these shortcuts are also available on a Chromebook and if I go the Windows key and arrow then this application will take this side of the screen and now I can choose what I want on the other side so perhaps I want so I can have this app taking up this space here now I can do is if I didn't need this to have so much information on this side I can use the Windows and up arrow key and then bring up another one of my applications that I'm using to actually record what I'm doing now. 
So there I have um, three of my applications up and running. I can actually do this one more time and have four applications running at one time here on one screen. If I had two displays, then I can have eight. Now there's really no limit on how many applications you can have running at one time in front of you as long as your computer doesn't crash or and as long as you don't get confused by having all this work in front of you. It's a great way to use your desktop to the fullest. So you could have a movie or something else playing here while you're doing your email or doing Facebook or whatever you do on your computer. Now if I wanted these to be minimized, I click on the minimize icon. If I want this to be maximized on this one, I click on maximize and it takes up the full screen again. Okay, now in the next segment of the lesson, we're going to be using the Chrome web browser. So what we want to do is start the browser by clicking on this icon that I'm circling for us. And we should have the browser up and running in case you don't have it already. Now, if you do not have the Chrome browser on your computer, you can download it for free. Where? Well, from www.google.com and then you can download the app and run it there. Once Chrome opens, you may log into your Chrome account if you're using it on a Windows device. If you're using this on a Chromebook, you're already logged into your Google account. Now, logging into your Google account allows you to see your bookmarks or your favorites, as well as any of your data, such as email, documents, photos, videos, or music that you've saved. So all that is available to you as long as you log in with your username and password. And remember, it's secure so no one else can see it. Now in this next video segment, I'm going to be going over how to find my YouTube channel. And those who are watching this video are probably scratching their head thinking, what in the world is this about? Well, it's for my classroom. And many of my students in my classroom have never used YouTube, never even found the, these lessons. And so I'm going to show them step by step on how to find my channel and how to subscribe. So bear with us for a moment. Okay, so how do we find YouTube? An easy way is to go over here to a new tab. Now once you've clicked on new tab, you usually always start at google.com. If your computer does not automatically go to google.com, very easy to find it. Just type in Google and then hit Control Enter and it'll take you right there. Now from there you'll notice that you have your apps right here and click on your Google Apps and we're going to be talking about all these apps in later lessons but today let me just show you YouTube and YouTube starts. Now to find my channel just go to the search box and type in my name, Selma Teacher 7, hit the enter key, and there I am. Go ahead and just click on the very first one there, and it will come up like you see here. Now from there, how do you use this? Well, there's my videos right there. I have them uh, set up already for you as playlists, and you want to scroll all the way down to where it says, Mr. Berry's Classroom Videos for Fall 2017. This is one of the newest groupings right here. And the very first one is for the nighttime class. There's 34 videos about upgrading your computer systems and doing everything else there. The middle one here is the computer literacy. That's the one that you're in right now. And then the last one here is computer technology mini lessons. Just simply click on play all and then you can stop a video and then scroll down and play a different one if you wanted to. Now if you go up to the top you'll notice that you have the word videos. If you go ahead and click on videos you'll then load all of my videos starting with the most recent ones at the very top here so you see the class syllabus is right there and then the older videos along further down as we go. So here this one was five months ago and this is four months ago, three months ago. So you see the pattern. And on any of these, you can see the title. If you want to look for a specific title, all you have to do is go in and click on the search box right here. And you can actually look for a specific title if that's what you wanted to. If you click on playlist, you can then see all the different playlists that I have here. So hopefully you can find my channel, click on the big red button that says subscribe, click on the little bell next to it for notifications, that way you'll be notified whenever I upload a new video.
let's go back to the lesson. So in this segment of the lesson, we've gone over how to find my videos on YouTube. Again, this is for the classroom, not for the ones already watching me on YouTube. And now the next part is another basic one. Uh, it's good for people who've never really used the, the browser. Um, we want to start the Chrome browser, if you haven't done so already. And then go in and you want to go to Google.com. So I'll do that here. And again, if you're not at Google.com, you just click in the address box, type in Google, go Control Enter, and there it comes up. Now remember, I'm not pressing the Enter key, I'm pressing Control Enter. So I'm holding down the control with my thumb, and I'm tapping the Enter key so it doesn't do a search for Google. No, I'm going straight to the location. Now once you're there, what we're going to do is, in the search box right here, we're going to look for cheapest books, so I'm going to click here and look for cheapest books. There we go. And now on cheapest books, I can click on some of these so I can find cheapest textbooks. And if I go down the list a little bit, we can find other ones here. At Book Finder. All right. So this is just an easy way to find books. I can find them by author, title, ISBN number. And if I was looking for books, that is one way to find. So now you can use the computer to find information. If I want to do other things such as let's find weather. It's 88 degrees and partly cloudy in Reedley. So there you go. It'll read you off the weather and give you even weather forecasting. So it's really easy to find the weather, do other things like that. And you might get a notification uh, the very first time you use Google to say, do you, do you allow Google to find your location? And if you say yes, then it can actually say, okay, you're in the city of Reedley. It just wants to bring you local weather. That way it doesn't give you weather for some place that's a thousand miles away. Now let's say that you were browsing and going around places and you wanted to add something to your bookmarks. How do you add something to your bookmark? Well, if you notice up here, I have a lot of my bookmarks. The very first time that you use Google Chrome, your bookmark um, bar might be hidden. And so to show it or to reveal it, you go to these three dots. This is the customized control icon. You click that. And once you click it, it comes down with this menu, go down to bookmarks, and there it says show bookmark. And it's checked off for mine, that's why you can see it. Now if you don't have it checked, just go ahead and click it and it will reveal your bookmarks for you up here. Now you start off with no bookmarks, but after a while you'll have a lot of them. How do you collect them? Well, you find a place that you want to go. For example, if you wanted to bookmark this page on weather, you can go in and click on bookmark and then you can put it into a special folder if you want to in this case like the folder called weather now let's just say that um, you didn't have a folder called weather and you want to do that how would you do it step one right click up here in your bookmark bar go down here to add folder and let's call it weather so there you go click on save you got the one called weather Add this page that's talking about your weather. Click on bookmark this page. Where do you want it? Well, I want it in weather. So I click on weather. I say done. Now when I go into my folder called weather, there it is. So it's that easy to add bookmarks. Another thing that you can do with bookmarks is you can move things around too. So if I wanted this weather to be over here next to EVs, I can do that. In fact, if I wanted something in here, in EVs, I can actually drag one of those and then put it in my weather, just like that. See, just drag and drop it. And that's done by pressing and holding the left mouse button and then moving my mouse pointer to where I want it to be. So I'll just put it back there. Now if I want to delete any of these again, it's just a right click and then say delete and then it'll take out that folder for me. 
Okay, we've about finished up page 15 now where we've talked about the Chrome browser. We've learned how to do a search for things such as we found weather. We've discovered how to add a bookmark, how to add a folder to your bookmarks, and how to manage your bookmarks by dragging them around. So it's really easy to do. Let's go on now to page 16 and we'll look at see how to close an app. To close any application, simply click on the X found in the upper right hand corner of the window. Programs may be also closed by pressing the Alt and F4 keys. This is called the Alt F4 shortcut. Shutting down the PC. When wishing to turn off a PC in Windows, you can follow these steps. Click on the Start button and select Shut Down. If the PC has been set to turn off with the Power button, you may also turn off the PC by simply pressing the power button once. You may also shut down a PC by using the shortcut Alt F4. Of course, you have to go through all the other applications first. Get to the desktop, then press Alt F4 and it will turn off your Windows PC as well. Here is a pro tip. To set the power button to turn off your PC in Windows 7 or 10, you can click on the Start button or the Start screen and then key in the words change what the power buttons do. Click on that option and follow the on-screen instructions to allow the power button to be used as a turn off button. Next to power off your Chromebook you can press the power button once. On some Chromebooks you may need to press and hold the power button for up to five seconds to shut down the device. You may also just simply close the clamshell to turn off the school's Chromebooks or your own personal Chromebook. You don't need to use the power button. You simply close it off as you see me doing there. Our next topic is Android. Android is an operating system that runs on many tablets, smartphones, and even a few laptops and desktop computers. And so here you can see the desktop on an Android device. You have your apps icons, your app launchers down here, the back for previously viewed, and then multiple apps window and then your home screen which usually looks like this. Up at the top you have your notification area and we do have special days where we're actually talking about smartphones and Android in particular. Let's now go to page 17 and we're going over the review questions for lesson number one. So what I'd like you to do is take out a clean sheet of paper write your name along the top line after answering these questions, turn them in to Mr. Barry. Please write out your answers on a separate sheet of paper if you're using the book, by the way. Number one, what does the function key F1 do within Windows? Number two, what kind of click will bring a special pull-down menu out of an item? Number three. What is the name of this mouse pointer? Number four, what things are found on the task bar? Number five, how do you change the time found in the notification area? Number six, what is the mouseless shortcut to switch between open applications and programs? Number seven, what is the shortcut used to close an app? Number eight, how may the computer communicate to you? Number nine, 
Number nine, what does the Alt F4 shortcut do? Number 10, what icon do you use to change the appearance or settings of the Chrome browser? Number 11, what does this mouse pointer mean? Number 12, what is an input device? Number 13, what do you click on to add a bookmark to the Chrome browser? Number 14, what do the three dots found in the upper right hand corner of the Chrome browser open? Question number 15, what does the Alt Tab shortcut do? Number 16. How are the keys on the keyboard organized? Okay, now we're going to go over the review terms for lesson number one. App. It's a self-contained application or program, a piece of software designed to fulfill a particular purpose. Desktop. It is the workspace on the computer where apps can be accessed and work is organized. Browser, an application with a graphical user interface for displaying HTML files used to navigate the World Wide Web. Input devices, any device that allows the user to input information into a computer. Operating system, also known as OS, it's the software that controls the computer's basic functions, such as executing applications, hardware behavior, and interfacing with the user. Every computer has an OS. Common operating systems are Windows XP, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10, Chrome OS, Android, Ubuntu, and Mac OS. All of these operating systems have a desktop, app launcher, and a way to alter their appearance. Output devices. Any device that allows the user to receive information from a computer. USB. Universal Serial Bus. It's a way of connecting peripherals such as mouse, keyboard, printer to a computer. And that wraps up lesson number one for the Computer Literacy course. Now, and today we've basically been going over the basics, so hopefully all the students there, if you do have other questions, I'm right here. Go ahead and give me a question and I'll be happy to help you. For lesson number two, we'll be going on beyond the basics, getting into our Google Drive, getting more into Google Docs and doing other things with the computers. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And I also love to read your comments. Thank you very much and bye-bye.